Migration is a central part of the life cycle of some of our most iconic fish species. Migratory fish travel huge distances, seeking out new feeding grounds, then returning to the rivers where they were born to reproduce. Some fish, like the salmon, swim thousands of miles to reach home. Their ability to migrate is of fundamental importance to their ability to reproduce and survive. But in recent decades, there's been a staggering 40% decline in global migratory fish populations. So that fish migration and the barriers to their migration has become a major issue in Ireland and around the world. the migration of the returning salmon begins here, way out in the open sea. They travel from the farthest reaches of the North Atlantic all the way back to the same place in the river where they were born. This journey can take a year to complete, covering distances of up to 3,000 kilometers. And despite decades of research, their ability to navigate their way across thousands of miles of open ocean is essentially still a mystery to us. But the rivers that they have been returning to for thousands of years have been utterly transformed. So I've come to the River Dodder in the heart of Dublin to get a sense of just how much our rivers have changed. Connor, what's happening here? Anya, we're taking a flow measurement on the River Dodder here. So this goes into our national hydrometric database so that we can monitor and model river flows around the country. And it allows us to monitor their changes through time. And what is the result? What's the flow then for this river after this monitoring this morning? So we've measured 1,300 litres a second, which given that we're only a day and a half away from a significant rainfall event is quite low. If this river was in a completely natural state, you'd expect the flow in it now to be maybe one and a half or more times its current flow. It really is a lovely river, but it's very far from its natural state. What is it that makes it so different to how it would naturally be? And the clue is in the name, Anya, Milltown. So in this region, in the 1800s, there was upwards of 60 mills on this river and its tributary. The river has been extensively modified as a result. The weirs that you see in the river, such as Milltown Weir, are very picturesque and very artificial. Both sides of the channel are also banked in vertically as the city encroached on it. So the river now exists in quite a narrow channel and is disconnected from what would have been its natural floodplain. I mean, historically, every village would have had a mill. So they're literally in every townland in the country. So many of our rivers have been engineered to an extent over, over history. We've had then barriers and weirs and changes to the, the structure of our rivers for, for a very long time. Why is it now becoming more of a problem? Well, I suppose it's an increase in awareness. So as we have worked so hard to, to reduce the discharges and the pollution in our rivers, it's become clearer that barriers are also a problem. I mean, as we look to a future with climate change, where we are predicted to have an increase both in flooding and in droughts, we're increasingly aware that if we want to return fish to our rivers, we're going to have to address this barrier issue in places. It's surprising to learn that almost every river in the country has been heavily engineered and modified in the past. Yet long after the mills are no longer in use, their infrastructure remains, disrupting river connectivity and often blocking the passage of migrating fish. Far away from the inland mills and weirs, I've come to the southeast to continue following the migration of the salmon from sea to source. On one of Ireland's top salmon rivers, the River Nore. Here, 
where salty seawater mingles with fresh river water, the salmon face the first major challenge of the river journey home. Their entire body has to readapt to fresh water. Once they enter the river, they stop feeding altogether. The physical torment of this transition must really test their instinct to return upriver. But they have a task to complete, a duty to the very survival of their species. So, tormented and hungry, they continue on the final leg of their epic journey home. But not all rivers in Ireland flow as freely as the River Nore. And here on the River Shannon, they meet one of the biggest barriers of all. This effectively is a really major barrier on the old River Shannon, specifically for the, the generation of hydroelectric power downstream at Ardna Crusha. Yes, that's right. Ardna Crusha was built in 1929. So the structure here was constructed then, and its purpose is for the diversion of water to the station in Ardna Crusha. 1929, so this is here for, for 19 years. Yes, and it hasn't actually changed very much at all, if, if any. Uh, some small changes, but essentially the structure is as it, as it was then. At the time that this was built then, there, there was quite a, a massive decline in salmon travelling up the Shannon. There would have been uh, a decline which is associated with the construction of the stations. Uh, obviously, it's a large physical structure to be built on a river. And at the time when, when this was built, was, was it anticipated that there would be an impact on migratory fish? Uh, not as such. There was the facility for fish passage. So behind my back here, there is a fish pass, which is a series of steps over which salmon can migrate up to. OK. So that's the, that's the only way they can get from the lower Shannon past this dam? Past this dam up. structure into the upper catchment. Okay. After the construction of the dam, it's estimated that catches of salmon plummeted by 90%, despite the inclusion of a fish pass, and stocks continued to decline over the years. So in 1958, the ESB opened a hatchery here at Parteen Weir to try to help offset the plummeting salmon stocks. So here we are in the salmon hatchery. Yeah. And we have young juvenile salmon, which are approximately nine months old. Okay. We're taking them from the tanks. We're putting them into a, a large bin of anaesthetic, which will knock them out. And the small little fin, the adipose fin, is clipped off by a pair of scissors. And why do you snip the fin off? We snip the fin off because it doesn't go back, and it's a, an easy identifier which can separate wild fish from hatchery fish. So it's just a matter of snipping off that wee fin so you know the difference between a hatchery fish and a wild fish? Yeah, that's it, exactly. Okay. And we release the fish then into the tank of okay. fresh water. Okay, okay. ESB fisheries have a lot of work to do to maintain a hatchery of this scale. But are they managing to meet the conservation limits needed for a salmon population to survive here in the Shannon? No, we're well below the conservation limit. We're currently at about 2% of the conservation limit. For the Shannon catchment, that is about 49,000 salmon, adult salmon coming back per annum. So we're in around maybe 2,000 fish per annum. So there's a couple of thousand salmon and making it past the, the power plant each year. Yep. Compared to how many do you, do you know would have come up 100 years ago before the power plant was built? Uh, 100 years ago, probably well over 100,000. And 100 years before that, probably several hundred thousand. So it's been a decline through time, through those decades. The interesting thing for me is that now you have to go to these quite extreme lengths to breed the salmon, to keep some salmon in the river. Yes, uh, that's the, the cost as such of, of hydro. And salmon is just one species of many fish species in the Shannon catchment. Visiting the hatchery, one really gets a sense of the cost and complexity involved in trying to offset the damage of a barrier of this scale. Most wild salmon and other migratory fish are cut off from hundreds of kilometres of habitat and spawning grounds above the dam. Other migratory fish, like lamprey and the now critically endangered European eel, 
have also had their numbers decimated. Because of these challenges, the ESB has recently teamed up with Inland Fisheries Ireland, the Environmental Protection Agency and local anglers to come up with a new Shannon Migratory Improvement Programme. Time will tell if this will help. But what about the rest of Ireland's rivers? How well do migratory fish manage on their epic journey from sea to source? I'm back on the River Nore, following the journey of the salmon from sea to source, tracing an ancestral lineage that stretches back thousands of years. It's hard to imagine, but this impressive species has survived empires and the Ice Age. Salmon have an amazing ability to distinguish between the subtly different waters of neighbouring tributaries, to find the exact stream where they themselves were born. But with the continued degradation of the water quality of so many of our best rivers, and the challenge of navigating so many barriers, you have to wonder how salmon still manage to find their way. If I were a migratory fish trying to make my way from the sea back to the spawning beds upstream, encountering a bunch of fishermen like this is the last thing I'd want. But nowadays, fish are finding unexpected allies in fishermen. Hello, Joe. Hello, how are you? Good. This is a lovely day for, for a bit of fishing. Isn't it just? Yeah, gorgeous. A little, bit, little bit of heaven. Yes, yeah. indeed. And this is uh, Thomastown Angling Club. You're all out with the club today. We're Thomastown Club, yeah. Yeah, I've been in existence now since 1948. Amazing. That's a long time for an angling club to keep going, isn't it? It is, and I've been a member of it all the way along. And is there much of a change, do you think, from the fishing in your, your father's time to the fishing now with your, your son or your grandchildren? Oh, the, well, the, there's a huge change in the sense that uh, you know, there aren't near as many fish in the river. Now, I do remember uh, running down from the school back in, 19, in the 1950s at lunchtime to see or to hear who caught fish, hoping that my father was among them. And that particular year, he caught just over 200 salmon in the season with a single rod. Now, I have never gone anywhere near that. Uh, neither has my son. John and I, my son, we fished quite a good bit last year. We landed and released 11 salmon last year. Between the two of us, 11 and we thought we had a good year. Given the declining stocks, many of our best salmon fishing rivers, like the Nore, now mainly operate on a catch and release basis. And many anglers have now become some of the most vocal defenders of the rivers they fish. I'm one of the lucky ones because I saw the, the golden years, as I say. I saw the, the river went as full of fish. Back years ago, no matter what happened, no matter how low to be, you'd always get the grill thrown and the young fish. They'd always run, so you'd have, you'd, you'd have them in abundance, which are very scarce now, very, very scarce. And that, that in itself is a problem. I mean, if you don't see young fish running the system, you're not going to get old fish, are you? Mm. I think now that uh, in a couple of years' time, we'll be in trouble. We, we might have no salmon in our system here. That's the way it is looking. I'm really struck by how few fish there are on the river compared to only 20 or 30 years ago. With so many threats and pressures facing these migratory fish, surely removing some of the barriers to the migration will help them. The determination of salmon is the stuff of legend. Salmon have been recorded leaping more than three metres up to get past waterfalls, weirs and other hurdles. 
Their strength and agility in overcoming seemingly insurmountable obstacles is what places the salmon at the center of so many of the world's mythologies, including our own. But now the salmon are gradually getting weaker by the day, not having eaten for months. Plus, they are literally scarred, battered and bruised from banging off rocks and concrete in their epic struggle to navigate all the barriers between them and their spawning grounds. Further upriver, I'm meeting with Siobhan Atkinson of the UCD ReConnect project. Siobhan's work mapping and surveying barriers, like this bridge apron, is part of an extensive new project to create an inventory of barriers on rivers all around the country. So if I'm a salmon and I've come all the way from the sea, I'm coming up this river here, how would I traverse this stretch of the river? They'd have a very hard time. First, they would have to jump from the plunge pool onto this really shallow area, which would probably cause physical injury to the fish. And then the water is probably too shallow for them to make their way up and then try and get over the weir. So this is quite a serious barrier for salmon, in these flow conditions anyway. You've been studying barriers to fish migration along the Nore. Yeah. Do you know how many barriers there are on the Nore? So uh, a survey by Inland Fisheries Ireland a few years ago identified 508 structures. 508? Yes, and only 11 of those structures were natural barriers. The rest were all man-made. So does that mean that if I'm a migratory fish travelling up, I have to cross hundreds of barriers by the time I get to the spawning beds. Exactly, yeah. So the cumulative impact of these structures is something really, that really needs to be considered. The salmon's journey up the Nore is turning out to be far more daunting than I had expected. To get a sense of just how much of an impact all these barriers are having, I'm travelling further upriver with Siobhan to observe an actual field measurement at yet another bridge apron, using a new cutting edge technology called environmental DNA. A number of water samples are taken from below and then from above the bridge apron to determine which fish are managing to negotiate this particular barrier and which ones are not. What kind of information are we going to get trapped in this little filter? So all the DNA that's floating around in the water sample we collected is trapped in this filter now. Okay. And when we bring this filter back to the lab, we can extract that DNA, run it through our qPCR machine and see if we can detect specific species. And you sampled this site last year already? Yes. What did you find? So this time last year, we detected salmon DNA below the bridge apron, but we didn't detect any DNA above it whatsoever. And how accurate is the test? Would you know for sure if there were any salmon getting above the bridge? Yeah, it's very sensitive and it samples a large area. Wow, okay. How much salmon habitat is beyond this bridge? So there are about 11 kilometers of suitable habitat for salmon above this bridge. There's 11 kilometres and the salmon just aren't able to get there? Yep. Because of this? Yeah. That is quite alarming. It is, yeah. Hearing Siobhan's alarming results makes me even more determined to continue following the salmon's migration on the final leg of their epic journey upriver. Having travelled for up to 3,000 kilometres, the salmon finally reach the spawning beds of their parents before them. The female salmon scrapes out a hollow called a red in the gravel. There, she lays about 2,500 eggs for every kilo of her body weight. The waiting male then fertilises the eggs. And some of these baby salmon, just like their parents, 
will one day make the same epic journey all over again. Salmon like these have been spawning here for thousands of years. The setting is perfect, but sadly, because of impassable man-made barriers, like the one we saw earlier with Siobhan, salmon probably haven't been spawning in this stretch of the river for generations. Barriers are just one of a multitude of challenges that salmon and all migratory fish face with the pressures of ever-expanding human activities. But as we begin to explore the possibilities of removing barriers, what are the chances of iconic species like the salmon making a recovery? That's the great capacity of salmon. One of their, their key attributes is to home, but also to stray. So they can exploit new habitats as they become available. And from some of the work that's been done in the States, where you have removed barriers, the fish very quickly come back, re-establish themselves. Now the solution would be quite different from the one that was originally there, but nature has a great capacity to adapt and to evolve. And incredibly, the ecosystems respond extraordinarily quickly once they're removed. Phil, is there much potential for removing barriers in Ireland and in Europe as well? Yes, absolutely. There's enormous potential to remove barriers and obstructions to migrations, to reconnect these ecosystems. But one of the key things is how to make decisions about which dams to remove. So when you're deciding those things, you, know, you need to have some kind of a framework to make those decisions. And this is something that we're working on currently with the EU Horizon 2020 project, the AMBER project, which is a trans-European project that has partners, I think some 20 partners, right across Europe. So the kind of tools they're thinking about is to mapping. And very interesting there that they have a citizen science aspect to that, that citizens can identify these obstructions in their own communities. In Europe alone, it's estimated that there are over a million dams and weirs blocking free-flowing rivers. The Amber Project will play a key role in mapping all of these. Information like this is motivating communities to act and inspiring initiatives like Dam Removal Europe. There is even now a World Fish Migration Day. Here in Ireland, we've already begun to modify barriers with fish-friendly bypass channels. And individuals can now contribute to our own National River Obstacle Inventory with this very user-friendly app. So if I want to record this barrier here, this yep. bridge, I can take a photo. Yep. Here we go. And then I just submit that and that comes into you. You've got a record and a photo and a location mm -hmm. of this obstacle and people all over the country can contribute. Yes. Their observations. Yeah. It certainly would appeal to me because in that way, if I'm logging the, the barriers that I see, I'm helping to be part of the solution to this problem. Absolutely. You're helping Ireland build a national river obstacle inventory. Brilliant. Citizen science in action. Absolutely, yeah. We humans are a busy bunch. And our ever-expanding activities have been putting enormous pressures on the natural world. Our impact on the salmon and on all migratory fish is no exception. Because for these fish, a barrier to migration is ultimately a barrier to life. <laughs> <laughs>